John, how serious is climate change today globally in the world? I think uh, I would describe climate change as the, the number one global crisis. And it's an overarching crisis. Uh, inside it, we've got many other crises from biodiversity, ocean acidification. We've got a whole range of serious crises, extinction uh, events and so on. But the single largest driver of global crisis today is climate change. It's beginning even to spill into politics, even into, into uh, economics to a lesser extent. So I would see um, climate change as the greatest single, uh, some call it a problem, others call it a predicament or a crisis, uh, but yet it's the, number one, it's the number one challenge or crisis in the world today. So John, when you look 10, 20 years down the road, how serious is climate change going to be if we don't mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions? I mean, essentially, climate, climate change is a growing problem. It's a problem that is, is quickly getting beyond our grasp. At the moment, we still have some options in terms of, of, of curtailing emissions and reducing future damages. But our, our options on this are running out rapidly. So to, to take your question, looking 10, 20, say 30 years down the line, we may already have been committed to temperature increases globally that will push the planet effectively into what's called a new climatic era. This is something that we absolutely must prevent happening. It's the most serious national and international crisis probably that the world has ever seen. And the lack of awareness of this, really, it's quite startling. And I think there's quite a lot of information, but very, very little focus. And I think a lot of the public have some, some general idea that it's a problem, but very few have actually twigged that this is, a, is, is not just a crisis, but it's the crisis. That in turn, I think, has led to our media and our political classes being, being treating this as something, a can that can be kicked down the road. So there is a tremendous sense that this is some other problem. It's a problem for people who live far away or it's a problem for future generations. In fact, it's neither. It's a problem for us right now and it's a problem for this generation. And are we ourselves, do we tend to kind of be in denial about it because it's inconvenient? I think so. I mean, climate change really threatens ourselves to some extent, but also how we see the future. We all have a, an idea of how we might like to see the future pan out for our children and so on. Climate change really threatens that in a very fundamental way. It makes people feel anxious. It makes people feel concerned. Now, these are not bad things in themselves if anxiety and concern lead to action and mobilization. But what we're actually experiencing in Ireland is the exact opposite. Anxiety and concern are actually manifesting themselves as denial. And we're seeing this all over the place, where presented with a lot of facts, a lot of information, what we're getting is the precise opposite of action. We're getting inaction, we're getting cynicism, and we're getting denial. And these are very dangerous traits when we're faced with a crisis like this, which isn't going away. And who's spreading this misinformation? I think the misinformation, certainly we're, we're getting a lot of it through the media. There's no question about that. There are a small rump of deniers operating here in Ireland. Now, we're really talking about a very small, very fringe group. Uh, but I think within the media, there are a lot of what I would call curmudgeons, people who believe, uh, who essentially are approaching scientific facts with their own ideological or political bias and then pre and representing and misrepresenting those facts to suggest, for example, that climate change is some kind of green hoax, some kind of socialist agenda. This is simply rubbish. And if you look at the fossil fuel industry today, how powerful are they and what sort of assets do they control? Well, the fossil fuel industry worldwide uh, controls assets that are run, running into trillions of dollars. It, it, it's one of the world's largest, most powerful and best organized industries, uh, both in the private sector and also state, state um, energy companies. And they have a strong vested interest in the status quo. They have an enormous investment in fossil energy resources that are in the ground. They plan to take those out of the ground and they plan to burn them. And they will resist anyone who suggests that that's a dangerous thing to do. And the science tells us right now that it's an extremely dangerous thing to continue the, the unfettered burning of fossil fuels. To put these in, in simple numbers, it's estimated that of the total known reserves of fossil fuels in the world today, only 20% of these can ever be burned. The other 80% must be left in the ground. 
Now the fossil fuel companies know the facts and they're fighting tooth and nail using the media, using uh, politics and using their influence throughout society to make sure that we don't understand the science. So the science disinformation campaign, its chief funder is the fossil fuel industry, but they have many friends. So tell me about funding. I mean, are the fossil fuel industry funding deniers and lobbyists around the world to discredit climate change? Absolutely. We, we've seen, as I said, within Ireland, not so much so. Um, but certainly in Britain and very, very, very standout in the US, you have major what they call think tanks, generally emanating from the right wing, which are receiving huge transfers of funds from various fossil fuel companies, often using a tactic called astroturfing. Now what that means is they create phony green fronts and then they create funding for them to make it look like there's a widespread public support for the fossil fuel industry. It's not in fact the case. I mean the fossil fuel industry, leaving aside for a moment climate change, the fossil fuel industry today kills maybe one and a half million people worldwide, die prematurely every year because of the coal and the oil that we burn. That's from premature deaths, mostly occurring in the third world. So anyone who thinks, for example, and it's often argued, that, that the poor need fossil fuels, the poor need fossil fuels like the poor need a hole in the head. So are these fossil fuel industries funding deniers and lobbyists? There's, and, and to what extent are they doing it? There's ample evidence, Duncan, that the denier campaign is being funded and, being, and being, they've created front organisations um, groups in the US like, for example, the Heartland Institute. And in the UK, we've got a group called the Global Warming Policy Foundation. It sounds very grandiose. It is, it is not interested in policy. It's interested in disinformation. This organisation refuses to publish who its sponsors are. And we know full well who their sponsors are. We know that they're, again, the same set of climate-denying energy industry people. But they're getting away with uh, not revealing their sources. Now, if... They have, if they have nothing to hide, then they can tell us who's funding them. And as long as they refuse to tell us who's funding them, we can assume that, that it's being funded from, from uh, sources with a, with a strong vested interest in, in creating and perpetuating denial.